become the student that she can be. Great. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, I've enjoyed listening to um, to Michael this morning because I, I, I wanted to jump up and cheer because I felt like what he was saying is exactly what I'm seeing and what I'm a part of and what I'm what I'm helping to accomplish. I, w I want to first say that it's a team that, that is making uh, this sort of stuff possible for students like Kaylee and other students in our school system where we're really promoting project learning. Kaylee's Learning Ecology and the other students at my school at Winterboro School in Talladega County, Alabama, are experiencing complete transformation in the method in which they learn. It's not just a one-to-one -one computer initiative type school. Uh, that, that's obviously important to have the tools, and, and Kaylee would be the very first. We've had lots of extensive conversations about how important those tools have been, but it's what she's doing with those tools. It's, it's about the end, or about the means, not about the end. And this is what she would explain. When I have authentic work that I have to complete because I care about what I'm trying to do, and it demonstrates my brains, my skill, and my who I am, and I'm demonstrating it to an outside audience, not just my teacher, but to someone else, I want to know what I'm talking about. I want to know everything about every single detail in a project. And this is what she would tell me. I learned. I learned to learn. I read, I explored, I researched, and I had a team of people. And I love that you mentioned the teacher job has to change. Yes, because you have mentors, people that understand what it is she's doing because her project might not be exactly like other students' projects. So she needs a mentor to understand her, a team of teachers that are working together. And we do team teaching. We, do, we teach courses in context together, not an English teacher talk. 15 minutes about English, and then the history teacher talks 15 minutes about history. It's, it's a together proposition about the content that we need to teach, but we do that. The master teachers that really understand that and are pulled in, as well as that teacherpreneur that understands there is something different that has to take place in Kaylee's learning in order to get her to that end, and they design it for her. She doesn't have an IEP, but she really, really did have an IEP over a course of a year. She didn't take an online course to bump her ACT score up. She tells you, I learned it because of the new style of learning, or I made the, the growth because of the way I have to learn now. And that makes all the difference in terms of her learning ecology. That transforms the teacher's ecology as well, because when we have to serve a student from that type of perspective, then what we do on a day-to-day -day basis has to change as well. Terrific. Um, Carrie, why don't you take us to um, Avery just a bit now, and we'll come back to Kaylee and Avery and Henry in a bit and what it means for teacher ed and accountability. But let's talk a little bit about Avery's story. Um, as you work uh, in inner city Chicago to help teachers and kids, uh, help kids get on what you call a path to self-regulation and how the interplay of technology, but also what the real hard work of face-to-face -face teaching is going to be even 20 years from now. So early on in our conversations on this project, I kept being sort of the voice in the room about the importance, not necessarily, yes, of brick and mortar, but also of the very important space that brick and mortar schools have for the relationships that exist between teachers and students. And our students that I serve, and a little bit about where I work, I work um, at National Teachers Academy. It's located at State and Cermak on the gentrifying area, which is called the South Loop. Um, my school was actually um, built as a result of a housing, one of the housing project buildings, part of the Harold Dickey's homes, being torn down to make way for that school. And so our school looked like sort of this modern beacon amid these aging housing project buildings. Um, the last building was torn down uh, over the summer. And over time, the families, the, the least resource families were consolidated into one building as the building started to be torn down. And so my story of Avery is one of our neediest of needy children that we serve. Her family was one of the, you know, she come from, came from a family that was one of the last hangers on to leave the community and go into new housing. 
And in our work with our resident teachers at National Teachers Academy in the organization, um, in AUSL, we talk a lot about supporting our students and developing relationships that are professional but rooted in care. Because for many of our students, they will do because we care. And if they sense we don't care, they will not do. But over time, we don't want them to be regulated by us and the relationship with us. We want them on a path to self-regulation. But we very much have to join them on that journey and help them to develop the skill set not only to regulate themselves in terms of their academic life, but also in terms of their social and emotional life. That might be trickier to do in an online environment. So as teachers' roles change, as Michael talked about, what might not change, though, is the very importance of that relationship between student and teacher being rooted in care. And it's very important that Avery has teachers in the building who know that her mother got in a fight with another parent over the weekend and that that happened, and that's impacting and affecting how Avery's walking into the classroom on Monday. Someone needs to know that so they can help her think through that because that is difficult for a 10-year-old child to work through on their own, especially one who has walking in the door is a bit, quote unquote, behind. So part of our training with residents is, yes, you have to have these professional relationships rooted in care. Even myself as a coach who I don't work with children, you know, I don't have a class of 32 kids, but I do lunch duty, I do morning duty, I sit in on their classes, I sit at a table with them, I work with them through some multiplication problems or, or looking at something online, and actually I need to have those same relationships with them. Because just because I'm a, a, a nice, friendly person sitting down next to them doesn't mean they're going to do for me. But they're going to do for me because they know, oh, I know your cousin. Oh, I just talked to your mother this morning. I saw your new baby brother. And that is going to motivate them to do more. But I don't want them to be motivated by that forever. We need to develop their sense of self-efficacy so they can do without us over time. So we need to have the professional relationships rooted in care, but we also have to make sure that as our resident teachers are developing and all our teachers are developing relationships with families and students and the community, that they're able to talk about the students holistically, who they are socially, emotionally, but also what is the data about them saying about where they are in terms of their academic need and how we need to focus to help them improve. Um, we have to translate that information to families so that it's user-friendly for them. And then it puts us on the hook for meeting the children's needs where they're at, which sort of segues into Jose, who's going to talk about Henry and how not one teacher can meet the needs of Henry, but how it takes a team of teachers to meet the needs of Henry. Go for it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, really quickly, I guess I really want to talk about Henry in the sense of uh, the sort of trend that we have now in this country, and that is uh, we have a lot of English language learners coming in to our country, and there's a dearth, a little dearth of people who can actually affect change for a student like Henry. Um, let's posit that Henry speaks Haitian Creole, and he comes into a school. Right now, at this point, if he came into a school, the first thing that would happen is he, if he came from a different country, he'd maybe get a test, a quick assessment, and then he'd be thrown into a classroom, and we wouldn't necessarily know what the skills are that he has, how literate he may be in his own language. We may not know anything about him. What I posit is that we should probably have a system in which the minute that he walks into that door, the teacher has at least a good 75% amount of knowledge about the student before he, he or she walks in. And the reason I say that is the following. I feel like when it comes to schools, we need to go back to having schools that are ingrained from the community. It comes from looking at the neighborhood and saying to ourselves, all right, what does this community really need? 